both of you in a funny sort of way have been exiled or, 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 or on the outside of the worlds that you, in some senses, appear to belong. So certainly for me, the whole experience has been uh, really liberating. I mean, I mean, it has been um, two fingers up to my perceived background and, you know, I'm, I was really thrilled at 42 to make this, you know, because I didn't want to be prancing at 42. <laughs> you know, there were times when I was doing the pop thing where I was thinking, I don't really want to. Be, I don't really want to grow up doing this. I don't want to be, you know, um, singing yes, for example, when I'm you know, 50. But I just didn't want that. You know, as good a song as it is, I wanted to like move on from there and do something a bit more grown up, which is probably not pop thinking. We're interested in the uh, uh, idea of how you came about deciding what the words would be based on, i.e., news stories. So were you worried about that idea that as a, as a kind of concept it, it, it might cease to be just a, an organic kind of song and sound too much like you were just taking headlines? Well, I think we've got um, slightly different takes on um, how, how, how we got here. When we first started speaking about um, you know, doing the collaboration, um, we were looking at um, Jericho, the French painter, the guy who did the raft of the Medusa, and, his, and, and um, I felt um, very inspired by uh, his motivation and um, he was reasonably unique at the time because he put um, contemporary events on his canvas rather than mm -hmm. things that had taken place 200 years ago. I was very inspired by that idea. Yeah. I'm also, you know, fascinated by um, the 21st century and what it means, yeah. you know. Um, I think the first time that idea popped into my head I was um, at uh, Hyde Park um, watching the Buena Vista Social Club, and I thought, oh, so this is what the 21st century looks like. One of the beautiful things about the record is that you do this really moving song about Susan Boyle, which again, you know, m m makes us feel that at least somebody's um, documented properly the, t the beginning of the 21st century, what's really happening, as opposed to us all just, like you say, being in the glare. But but tell me about the idea of writing a song about Susan Boyle. Did, did, you, did you like Susan Boyle's voice when you first heard it? Did you have sympathy for Susan Boyle? I, I absolutely refused to um, like be engaged by it because I knew I was, because I, was, I was being worked by the, by the cowl machine. It's like, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't care, you know, how many people watch her on YouTube and I just like, you know. And, yeah, um, so I felt the same. Yeah. I kind of had reports and reports and reports of this phenomenal thing on YouTube and, and I just wasn't curious enough to see what it, to see what it was. It was re re really struck by what, what, what the whole thing meant and it was the remarkable illusion of a frumpy Scottish spinster walking on stage that made everybody go, oh wow, and that, that, I think that's why it was so effective. She became an overnight sensation, but that's because people, um, you know, looked at the, a gorgon, open her mouth and like, you know, create beauty. So I, you know, didn't really want to be engaged by it, but then, you know, um, I was, um, she, when it was over, you know, she, and, and she went into the Priory, you know, I, I, I got interested in the story. The music, um, Franklin from Wonderland, which is one, probably my favourite piece of um, music by Michael. Um, there's, a, there's a real sense of, um, you know, loneliness and isolation to it, and um, she um, seemed to be a suitable story, so I, you know, had a good look at her life. Mm you know, and um, came, up with, came up with the glare that way. It's always interesting to see who is, a, who, who is allowed. You know, I've always believed that um, success was um, in and of itself quite a selective thing, you know. It just, um, you, 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 you can't have certain tools and expect. You know, you hear about all sorts of people falling by the wayside and, and wonder why other people become successful. But it's also a very slow process, and you know, the terrible thing now is it's, kind of instant, you know, if you can sing in unison with George Michael, you're kind of a great singer. Um, and, you know, sad, the sad thing about The X Factor is that it is about singers, but the, but the only interesting act was, was, was Jedward. And they should have won, because at least they were entertaining. But of course, from the kind of Simon Cowell point of view, he could have made no, no money from them except sort of putting them to the Hackney Empire pantomime mm. or something. Well, the disturbing thing about the X Factor is that you look at it and you see something happen, you see an event take place, and then you listen to these four people, you know, a motley crew, um, saying that it's great and what you just heard wasn't. It's like, no, it wasn't. 
it, it, it wasn't. It was terrible. But then you just watch four people say that was like you but know that, extraordinary. But that is a great metaphor for the modern world, where you read so much stuff about music now that tells you that it's the most important thing you've ever heard, and then you go and hear it, and you think that's not actually what what it, what it, you know. Everybody wants to hype up the world to mm. make it so much more sort of. Yeah, yeah but they're only really they're really only dealing with well, how to can't remember how to pronounce this simulacrums or whatever. Mm. So if there was someone who really had an individual voice, you know, sort of, if there was a sort of sixteen-year-old Lou Reed, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have made it. Mm. Uh, and you know, for sort of seventeen-year-olds and eighteen-year-olds saying, "Oh, this is the best thing that's happened in my life," mm. well, what's happened in their life mm. anyway? And there was a very interesting documentary last night after the X Factor, you know, where it actually, you know, showed her singing in a sort of working men's club in a sort of So you were watching town. The X Factor last night? I watched The X Factor and I was switching over to, uh, to <laughs> watching the, the sports personality. But the interesting thing was that when she actually met her kind of hero, Elaine Page, and uh, her model, and um, she performed a duet with her, I thought, Susan Ball was a much more interesting singer, a much more <laughs> controlled singer than, than Elaine Page, who was kind of wobbling all over the place. And so he's um, doing a political X Factor now. Have you heard about this? He, he, he actually said so. He's actually in, in a Newsnight interview tonight. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. He's actually saying that he's planning to do a political show. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because te um, t apparently the, the, the 10 million vote last night was more than voted in the last election. Yeah, but just as he's, he's kind of he's kind of sidelining musical talent mm. and careers being being based on kind of serious selection of choices. Mm. So maybe he can kind of, uh, you know, subvert democracy by doing it in, you know, one evening, one vote, thank you very much, mm. yeah. goodbye. Yeah. And uh, I think it's extremely dangerous. You've been part of and commented as a journalist early on on a certain musical narrative and you've been part of one and in a way by talking about the X Factor was sort of talking where pop music has kind of ended up in a way but I was also interested in in you know you, you, when you started writing about music in six in the 60s and came upon the term minimalism and you you, you noticed these patterns whether you st still feel that those patterns you noticed then coming out of out of Stockhausen and then into minimalism do you feel that those patterns can still be detected that there are patterns still carrying on or is it as it splintered to such an extent there's, there's nothing no, I, I, to no I, I, I mean I you know obviously when I sat down and started writing things like in Ray Don Giovanni you know I plundered mm. the classics you know like Mozart because that was my mm. that was my training that was the music I knew like Steve Reich plundered um, you know jazz or Balinese music because that was the music he was um, brought up on, um, and then kind of explo exploded it, you know, not by making it a kind of nostalgic recreation of of the classics, but sort of taking it somewhere else. But the, the extraordinary thing is that, that nothing much else has happened, and basically, you know, unfortunately, younger composers are sort of recycling, I think, things that happened in the 60s and 70s, and it's kind of interesting there's a whole generation of kind of young composers who are now discovering things that we lived with in the 60s and 70s, like, you know, Cornelius Cardew, um, uh, without really knowing the sort of cultural context that it came out of. But I just wonder what they have to offer, you know, where the, you know, where the new Steve Reich is, or where the new Cornelius Cardew is, or even where the knew Michael Nyman is, I don't know. And when you did this record, did, 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 you, did you feel that there was that slight element of a, I mean, there is a world, I mean, I often think of this world where something like this record is actually, you know, it is an eight million seller. You know, it's not a difficult record, it's not a complicated record, it's, it's a very entertaining record and it's, it's using a lot of information that people are very aware of. For some reason, that, that isn't happening. But, but I was just interested if you felt that it was a, like a what-if story, you know, what if there was a kind of music around at the moment that had followed some of these stories so that, you know, part of it comes from Motown and pop and then part of it's aware of minimalism and post-minimalism and it, it kind of finds a place to meet. Well, the trouble is that, that you can talk about it, you know, we can sit there on the sofa talking about it. Well, it is Christmas Day. Till the, yeah. till, the cows, till the cows come home uh, and, you know, great journalists can write great reviews of it. Um, but, you know, as you know, the proof of the music is in the hearing. Mm. No one actually hears it. Mm. Uh, you know, five seconds of the glare 
the actual song, is worth, you know, 50,000 words of, of writing about it and talking about it. You know, I can talk about it in terms of how it relates to the European tradition, Baroque music, or how it relates to minimalism, whatever. But, and people say, well, what's all that about? And you sit them down with sort of chasing sheep is best left to shepherds and say, oh, that's what it's all about. Forget the words. So what are you going to play uh, today then? Uh, the coldest place on earth. This is a song that David has just written especially for, for your show, uh, Jesus. Um, <laughs> um, and based, I mean, it's a song that, he, that David has written over, you know, the main theme from the piano, the heart house pleasure first, which itself, you know, a bit like in Ray Don Giovanni, is based on a pre-existing piece of music, a, um, a Scottish popular song. I don't know whether it's a folk song. I was talking to David on the phone yesterday, and I, he said, what was the origin of that tune? And I said it was a kind of popular song called um, Gloomy Winter's New Awa. And there was this kind of audible kind of gulp at the end of the phone because, as David told me, the lyrics you've written are to do with cold, to do with kind of... Yakutska, uh, Siberia, um, the coldest town on earth, minus 65, taken from an article in The Independent. <laughs> <laughs> So there's another sort of strange sort of coming together mm. of uh, knowledge and, and instinct and innocence, which I think yeah. is what makes, makes this album so good.